while the paratroopers of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions jumped into the unknown in the early hours of June 6, 1944, the 4th Infantry Division was preparing itself to land into the unknown as well. The IV Division had been tasked by 7th Corps with the capture of Utah Beach, the northernmost beach of the Normandy landings. In this video, we will take a closer look at the Battle of Utah Beach. The first action at Utah Beach was conducted by the 4th and 24th Cavalry Squadrons and the Lieutenant Colonel Dunn. Both squadrons landed on the Ile saint marcouf at 4.30am. The small islands were suspected to house observation posts which could jeopardise the landings at Utah Beach. Although the islands were found to be unoccupied, a few casualties were taken by the Americans owing to mines. At 5.30am, the islands had been cleared. While the cavalrymen were clearing Ile saint marcouf the infantrymen of the 4th Infantry Division got ready to board their landing crafts. At the same time, the bombardment force of ships and aircraft started to pummel the Atlantic Val defences. The time was H-40 or 5.50am when the bombardment between Les Dunes de Varville and Bourguillot began. Utah Beach consisted of two main landing zones, Terre Green to the north and Uncle Red to the south. Terre Green was just opposite the Les Dunes de Varaville strong point, while Uncle Red was opposite La Madeleine. Defending the beaches were the men of the 1st Battalion Grenadier Regiment 919 of the 709th Static Infantry Division. The first wave consisted of 20 landing crafts, each carrying 30 men. The first wave assault was carried out by the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 8th Infantry Regiment. The 1st Battalion was tasked with landing at Terre Green, while the 2nd would land at Uncle Red. Leading the charge would be companies E and F for the 2nd Battalion and B and C for the 1st Battalion. Touchdown was scheduled at 6.30am. 32 duplex drive Sherman tanks were to be dropped off around H hour from 8 landing craft tanks. B Company of the 70th Tank Battalion would support the 2nd Battalion at Uncle Red, while Company A, also of the 70th Tank Battalion, would land at Terre Green in support of the 1st Battalion. The second wave was planned to land five minutes after the first. This wave comprised a remainder of both battalions, with companies G and H at Uncle Red and A and D at Terre Green. In this second wave were also several combat engineer and naval demolition teams. Fifteen minutes after H hour, the dozer tanks of Company C, 70th Tank Battalion were touched down. Two minutes after them, elements of the 237th Engineer Combat Battalion would land at Uncle Red and elements of the 299th Engineers Combat Battalion would land at Terre Green. The first wave arrived at its line of departure on time and launched smokes so that the artillery barrage would lift. The 600 men of the first wave landed on time and started to wade forward. However, the landings had taken place some 1,800 meters to the south. Instead of landing opposite Exit 3, the first wave landed opposite Exit 2. Both control vessels for Uncle Red had been lost and one of the vessels for Terre Green had to turn back, leaving only one control vessel for both beaches. This combined with a strong tidal current and large clouds of smoke are a few possible reasons why the landings took place further south. In spite of the wrong location, the attack went well. Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt Jr., the 4th Division's assistant commander, had volunteered to coordinate the initial attack on Utah Beach until Colonel James Van Fleet, the commander of the 8th Infantry Regiment, had landed. Realizing that they had landed in the wrong area, Roosevelt Jr. personally reconnoitred the ground to the rear of the beach to find the causeways that were needed to launch the assault inland. He subsequently returned to the landing grounds, where he contacted Lt. Col. Conrad Simmons and Lt. Col. Carlton McNeely in command of the two leading battalions. The erroneous area of landing actually came as a gift, as there were less beach defences to overcome and it was less obstructed, facilitating the overall coordination. The destruction of beach obstacles began straight after the engineers had landed. With a swift capture of the landing beaches, the engineers too had an easier job in clearing the obstacles. Within an hour, the beaches were cleared and the 3rd Battalion 8th Infantry Regiment and 3rd Battalion 22nd Infantry Regiment were already crossing Uncle Red and Terre Green respectively. The 1st Battalion 8th Infantry Regiment was quickly ordered to clear the La Madeleine strong point, while the 2nd Battalion attacked the pillboxes and trenches at Bourguillot. The La Grande Dune defences were overcome in a joint effort. All assaults only met light German resistance, resulting in a swift capture of the main German defences blocking the exit routes. Within two to three hours, the assaulting forces had been reorganised after eliminating all threats on the beach and focus was put inland. 
The 1st Battalion, 8th Infantry Regiment proceeded towards Exit 3, while the 2nd Battalion of Lieutenant Colonel McNeely headed towards Exit 1, the southernmost exit. The 3rd Battalion of the 22nd Infantry Regiment had touched down at Tear Green at 7.45am and was tasked to proceed north along the beach and eliminate the other strong points. The 3rd Battalion of the 8th Infantry Regiment had also touched down at 7.45am. They landed at Uncle Red and moved to Exit 2. By 8am, four infantry battalions had landed and they were all heading inland to secure contact with the paratroopers who had jumped over Normandy earlier that morning. At 10am, also the 1st and 2nd battalions of the 22nd Infantry Regiment touched down on Utah Beach. Because the eastern end of Exit 4 was still under heavy fire, the battalions were forced to wade through the inundations to reach the western edge of the causeway, thus bypassing the immediate danger. They were ordered to secure Saint-Germain-de-Varreville to the north and were forced to cross Exit 3, which was by that time terribly congested. The erroneous area of landing was starting to cause trouble to the 4th Infantry Division and 70th Tank Battalion. The initial planning allowed vehicles, especially the Sherman tanks of the 70th Tank Battalion, to use both Exits 2 and 3. However, Exit 3 was still too close to the German positions up north, forcing all tanks to use Exit 2 instead. This caused even greater congestion problems at Exit 2. When a culvert on the path was found destroyed and the leading Sherman tank hit a mine blocking the path, the problems got even worse. The second tank was subsequently knocked off the path by an anti-tank gun and it wasn't until the third Sherman tank in the column knocked out the German anti-tank gun that the 70th tank battalion could advance forward. By noon, other vehicles were starting to use the exit as well. Shortly after noon on the 6th of June 1944, the 12th Infantry Regiment was starting to touch down at Utah Beach. The 12th Infantry Regiment's objectives were to the left of the 22nds, forcing the men of the 12th to wade across the inundations as well. Meanwhile, the 1st Battalion of the 8th Infantry Regiment had largely cleared Exit 3 under considerable German artillery fire. Nonetheless, the GIs continued their advance and as the evening fell, they had gotten to just short of Turqueville in the centre of the beachhead. The 3rd Battalion of the 8th Infantry Regiment cleared Exit 2 and the neighbouring hamlet of La Houssey. They proceeded towards Saint-Marie-du-Mont and upon reaching the hamlet of Germain, the battalion was met by stiff German resistance. They encountered a myriad of dugouts and trenches as well as three or four of the dreaded 88mm guns. Slowly but surely, the battalion closed in, taking out at least 50 Germans as they retreated to the rear. A further 100 men were taken prisoner. After their difficult firefight, the 3rd Battalion proceeded westward, eventually reaching a position just north of Les Forges. During the night, a platoon of Company K was sent out towards Chef Dupont in an attempt to establish contact with the 82nd Airborne Division. After clearing their relatively small exit, the 2nd Battalion of the 8th Infantry Regiment headed to Poupeville. After stressfully crossing a few minefields on the beach and clearing the Bourguillot Strong Point, the 2nd Battalion swiftly reached Poupeville, where they met several paratroopers of the 3rd Battalion 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division. After establishing contact with the paratroopers, McNeely's men pushed on, eventually reaching Les Forges. By midnight, the 8th Infantry Regiment had reached its initial D-Day objectives. They had managed to contact 101st Airborne Division at Boupville and they had reached the main road heading south to north on the Cottentin Peninsula. However, there was still a strong force separating the men of the IV Division and the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division at saint marie glise Although the 505th had attacked the Germans earlier in the day, the latter regrouped at Fauville, consolidating their positions. In the late afternoon, elements of Howell Force and a part of the 82nd Airborne Division to which Howell Force was attached landed ashore. The force was commanded by Colonel Raff and comprised of a platoon of the 4th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron, a company of the 746th Tank Battalion and 90 men of the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment. Howell Force was tasked to link up with the 505th at saint mary glise but the Germans at Fauville had thrown a spanner in the works of the 82nd Airborne Division. The 3rd Battalion, 8th Infantry Regiment didn't intend to advance any further that evening, but they did request artillery on Fauville, which they were denied. Colonel Raff still had to complete his mission and promptly advanced forward. Two attempts were made to dislodge the Germans from Fauville and clear a path for a part of the glider infantry which was supposed to glide in at 9pm. 
However, both attempts were repulsed by the German defenders. During the first attempt, one of the Sherman tanks was disabled and during the second attempt, two Sherman tanks were destroyed. When at 9pm the gliders were seen in the air, the Germans still held Fauville. The gliders came down under murderous gunfire. Some came down in German-held territory and several more crash-landed, causing considerable casualties. RAF could do nothing but collect stragglers and dig in near Les Forges. Although the 8th Infantry Regiment had largely reached its objectives, its sister regiments hadn't. After wading through the waist-deep inundations, the 12th Infantry Regiment dug in just short of beuzeville au -Plain. The 1st Battalion deployed on the right, while the 2nd Battalion completed the line on the left. The 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 22nd Infantry Regiment had spent up to 7 hours in the inundated grounds before finally reaching dry land. They still had to clear Saint-Martin-de-Varreville, which they did with relative ease. The regiment was able to reach Saint-Germain-de-Varreville further to the north, where they dug in for the night. The 3rd Battalion of the 22nd Infantry Regiment, still on the beach, managed to get as far as Hamel de Crutz before calling it a day. Utah Beach was relatively secure, but only the southern units managed to reach their designated objectives. There was still a lot of work to be done the following day to further secure the beachhead. German counterattacks were imminent, and they would have to be beaten back first before thinking of joining the Utah and Omaha beachheads. Fortunately for the Americans, Utah Beach was captured with relative ease, also resulting in a lower casualty figure than had initially been estimated. The 8th and 22nd Infantry Regiments, which had landed before noon, suffered a combined total of 118 casualties, 12 of them being killed. During the first day of the Normandy landings, the 4th Infantry Division had suffered a total of 197 casualties. These include 60 men of Battery B, 29th Field Artillery Battalion, that went missing as they were lost at sea. By midnight, a total of 20,000 men had landed on Utah Beach, as well as 1,700 vehicles. The capture of Utah Beach was a staggering success, with very few losses. The unbreakable Atlantic Wall defences at Utah Beach, manned by the 1st Battalion Grenadier Regiment 919, was not so unbreakable after all. Almost the entirety of the 4th Infantry Division was ashore as well as some headquarter units of 7th Corps. Nonetheless, General Collins, the Corps commander, remained on the bayfield. Contact had been established with the 101st Airborne Division, but there was still a lack of information on the 82nd Airborne Division's positions. Collins, however, had full confidence in the veteran Airborne Division and wasn't too concerned, as the reports of the sister Airborne Division were favourable. Later in the day, Admiral Moon, in command of the landing operations, became worried and wished to temporarily suspend the landing operations after he had lost several of his assets. However, with General Collins' command post being near to that of Moon, Collins convinced Moon to keep bringing up vehicles and personnel to Utah Beach. That way, more and more GIs landed inside the Utah Beach beachhead. The Germans at Utah Beach had been completely overrun. Elements of Grenadier Regiment 919 were quickly forced to give way to the 4th Infantry Division, and by midnight, two battalions of the 8th Infantry Regiment had managed to reach their objectives. The 12th and 22nd Infantry Regiments had advanced to the north and contact with the 101st Airborne Division was quickly established. Only reports of the 82nd Airborne Division were scarce, but Collins in command of the Corps wasn't too worried about them. More and more units were brought into the beachhead and everything was being prepared to expand it. This was the Ace Destroyer, I hope you enjoyed this video about the Battle of Utah Beach. If you enjoyed this video, I can highly suggest another of my Normandy themed videos. You can find the suggestions here. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already and I hope to catch you in another video. Cheers!